now really excited to introduce to everybody uh, an old friend and colleague, uh, Donato Tremuto, uh, who is a long history of digital health uh, success in using digital technologies in healthcare to improve patient outcomes. And uh, now he's, uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to have him in a situation where he's now sharing some of his lessons learned and some of his uh, much acquired wisdom over the last few decades. I won't say how many decades, Donato, uh, in his uh, recent, recently published book. And, and uh, today we're here to hear about how, and it comes off nicely from our last panel, how compassion, we must lead with compassion in today's healthcare ecosystem and really entirely uh, the entire social construct ecosystem, leading with compassion. Donato, welcome this morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stan. I, uh, I like the word uh, friend, not old, um, <laughs> but great, great to see you and um, thank you for everything you're doing. No, and thank you for joining us this morning. We know again how busy you are and um, uh, you know, if you could just give the audience, we have people from all over the world. Some of them may not have uh, heard, may not know your work and uh, your, your long history of success as, an, as a digital health and healthcare executive uh, over the years, but maybe you could give some people a, a couple minutes of background on yourself. Absolutely. And um, it's hard to believe, Stan, I've known you probably nearly, you know, over 20 years. I've been in healthcare for the last uh, four decades, uh, have launched two uh, startups. Um, uh, and uh, recently, I was the CEO of Tivity Health, which provided uh, one of the largest uh, well-being programs for seniors. And in 2011, I launched the Healthy Villages organization, uh, and you'll hear about that later in my, um, my speech here. But the last couple of years, I've been very focused, especially just hearing the comments here this morning about the pandemic, that um, we have a need for compassion and kindness and how we lead. And I really do believe it begins with the healthcare executives. And um, uh, I'd like to just maybe jump into the speech and I think people will learn a lot about what, um, what we've done to really advance that compassionate leadership model. That's absolutely spot on. And, and tell us a little bit about the, the book that you've written and, uh, and what it discusses and, and what, what some of the major tenets are. Yeah, and I think, you know, for many, many years, you know, I would use the word, you know, compassionate leadership. And, you know, I would be somewhat accused of being a weak leader. And what we've done is we interviewed 41 world leaders. And I believe your audience will know many of them, Bruce Broussard from Humana, Katie Couric, uh, Senator Bill Frist. Uh, but we also interviewed a 16-year-old young lad who started a healthcare organization which is using technology to help seniors learn how to use social media and how to turn their iPhones on as a means to pull them out of their loneliness. So we interviewed 41 world leaders, but we also surveyed 1500 people across the United States to match their viewpoint of what compassion means to the control group of 41 individuals. And the data, and I know Stan, you're very data driven, the, data is just amazing. And so I don't want to let out too much about the book. It'll be available in March. It's uh, delayed because of a paper shortage. Um, however, the book will be available um, uh, March 1st. And um, I think it will help many of us to understand that compassionate leadership is not about being nice. It's about empathy in action. And that's the definition we came up with. That's fantastic. And when you think about that, and you, when you think about empathy in today's healthcare system, again, we were just talking with two leaders, one from the, the Australian Army and the United Nations, and another one within the National Health Service and the Royal Society of Medicine uh, about this. And when you think about leading with empathy in action in healthcare today, uh, an industry and in a field that's under an extraordinary amount of stress in trying to manage uh, life and death consequential situations on a, an hour by hour basis these days, uh, and, and trying to manage patients and, and, and diagnose and treat patients in ways that have never been done before, heavily virtualized. And how, how does leading with empathy in action, uh, how does that play and how does that fit into this uh, new post-pandemic, endemic uh, healthcare system globally? Well, I think all the issues that we are dealing with 
Uh, many of them in the healthcare arena, the social determinants of health, food insecurity, loneliness, all of them really find their roots in understanding the viewpoint of the other person. I'll give you a great example. About a year ago, I was um, in contact with a um, uh, investor and he challenged me as to why he would want to invest in a program that provided food for individuals. He said they should go out and find a job. And I said, you don't realize that the social determinants of health, sometimes individuals don't have the means that you and I have. It could be that they live in rural America. They can't find a job. And so I think we have to get down to the basic and understanding the other person's viewpoint. And I think all the issues, whether it's the social unrest, whether it is the social determinants of health, they all find their tenants in understanding the other person's viewpoint. And then we can work together. You know, I came up with a word in the book, uh, collaboration. And it's a word that I introduced because I don't think that innovation alone is going to solve our problems. It's gonna be integration and innovation that we're gonna to have to be willing to say that maybe I have one part of the solution, but Stan, you have the other part. And your willingness to collaborate is a key nugget to compassionate leadership. Yeah, that, that really goes a long way in, in spelling it out. And, and it's interesting because it's so difficult, you know, really to train empathy, to have people think about the other person's point of view and the other person's standpoint. And we've seen that at HitLab when all, all of the different executives we work with from payers, providers, pharma, employers, uh, trying to see and understand how the digital health startup needs their empathy to understand how this technology it, ha it has to be treated differently than maybe a, a major technology like an SAP or a Cisco systems. These are small companies who don't have 20 years of experience in procurement or implementation, et cetera. And so when you apply your lessons that you've derived in this work to the digital health startup, and to, well, let's start with the executive because they're really the ones that are you know, uh, trying to find ways to fit these new emerging technologies into their ecosystems. How do you fit that? How, how do you fit some of the empathy and action tenets of your work into the mindset of an executive working with digital startups? Well, I think it begins first of understanding that you have to approach each issue today with an understanding that you may not have all the answers. That's where the empathy comes in. And I believe there's four key pillars to how we're gonna solve the problems today. We talk about it in the book. You have to have that ability to have data and technology and a platform, but you also have to have the ability to have interventions that get matched with incentives to change the behavior of an individual. And then you have to go back and measure it. When you look at those four pillars, it's very difficult sometimes to see one company having all four. And so if you can approach this with an empathetic understanding that it's not about what you achieve, it's about what you're going to solve for the consumer. And that's the mi mindset that I think it's changing now is individuals, I mean, look what happened with Teladoc and Lavango, you know, the ability to combine and connect. Both companies could have gone uh, forward on their own, but they got together understanding that they could solve some of these problems quicker by uniting the resources they have. And I think that's what's changing in healthcare. Quite frankly, I think that's what has to change in our society is that willingness to increase your collaborative IQ. The higher your collaborative IQ, the more compassion you have and the more empathy that you practice. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt about it. And that, that's, that, that's absolutely the, the key to success. And there was just a research study that, was, that came out uh, earlier this week about this combination of EQ and emotional intelligence, emotional quotient, which uh, you, you talk about, and then obviously IQ. And it's not being super high EQ or super high IQ that is gonna make you successful as a leader, but it's that combination of both. Uh, would, would you agree with that statement? Absolutely. And you know, one of the most interesting findings in the study that we did is that there is a significant, what I call age gap. And I think that's one of the things we talk about, you know, the average age of the CEO in the United States right now is 59. And interesting, that doesn't um, differ from our elected officials in Washington, yet we are hiring individuals in the C-suite in our own age bracket. And so part of that EQ is understanding that you have to have age diversity on your team. 
And, you know, I just recently hired somebody for the Healthy Villages organization. I never would have done this. Um, she's a recent graduate out of uh, St. Michael's College in Vermont. Uh, normally, I would have looked at somebody in my age bracket thinking that they have all this experience. What a big mistake I made. And so part of that empathetic approach is understanding that you want diversity on your team. Bring the younger people with the middle age, with the older people, so that you have a diversity of thinking that's going on in some of the solutions to the problems that you're solving. Yeah, and that's that's a really you know brilliant you know point there is that it, it is this uh, this need to really bring uh, some of the emerging leaders out of this new generation to the front of the uh, really the front lines of tackling these big issues, right? Well, I caught the last um, you know comment you made in your um, talk before you know you and I got together here. The great resignation. So many of the individuals who I'm coaching right now who are addressing this started off by thinking that they had to give more pay. And those who are leaving their jobs are not leaving because of pay. They're leaving because they don't have this sense of belonging. They don't have this sense of purpose. So we're going to have to infuse purpose back into the work environment. And part of that purpose that we talk about in this Compassionate Leadership book is that if you hire somebody, regardless of their age, they have a seat at the table. And we need to take time to listen to their point of view. We need to take time to understand that they have a contribution to make. And if we don't do that, I think this great resonation is going to escalate even further. Okay, great. And I, I know you wanted to make a, a you know more of a, a presentation about which uh, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, if you could, yeah, please do lead with that as well. Very good. Uh, well, let me first just, you know, you know, Stan, thank you and all those um, whose work during the last 18 months has helped to lift up the spirits of those who have endured great suffering during these unprecedented times. I'm honored to be part of today's event, uh, having worked in the digital healthcare space for the last two decades, and as I stated before, in healthcare for the last uh, four decades. However, Today, I stand before you simply as a person who cares about humanity and making our world a more compassionate place. Our fellow New Englander, the poet Emily Dickinson, called loneliness a horror. It's a stark description that appears in one of her better known poems, The Loneliness One Dare Not Sound. Some say she likens being lonely to being buried alive, and I agree because I truly know what that means. The poem is a brief haunting piece, rich in humanity and humility. She reminds us that to feel the pain of loneliness is to be human, but to understand this kind of pain, you must feel it yourself and experience what other people have gone through. I think in modern times, it is sometimes credited to a popular and influential faith leader, the Dalai Lama. There is a story of a boy who learned these ancient life lessons at the age of eight. An ear infection robbed him of his hearing. Gone totally were the simple, happy sounds of childhood. A songbird in spring, a puppy's playful yacht a bumblebee at work, a mother's loving voice. For nearly a decade, this boy endured no fewer than five experimental surgeries. He was ridiculed and bullied by his peers, friends, even family. Finally, surgery worked. However, when the bandages were removed from his ears, the horror of not hearing was replaced by the horror of hearing himself speak. He could not pronounce his R's or W's. Many believed he had a learning disability. And as luck would have it, his sister-in-law was a speech pathologist at the local university. The boy got help. He recorded his speech every single day, repeating the words and sounds. He made real progress. He taught himself to speak again. The boy brought this tenacity to college admissions offices, but they concluded he was disabled with low academic potential. However, he convinced one university the label was neither fair nor appropriate. Pain infused the boy with strength, 
which he used to graduate summa cum laude four years later. Despite being voted most likely not to succeed, the boy went on to become a successful business leader, a published author, and a global healthcare activist. Friends, that young boy was me. My isolation in those precious, brief young years was total horror. Emily Dickinson was right. Loneliness is a horror. I never knew it would last into my sixth decade, and it took the solitary confinement of this pandemic to teach me that it can swirl back out of the past. COVID-19 has been a fierce instructor and equal opportunity jailer that has affected us all. Just 18 months ago, nobody would imagine a world that masked our smiles and outlawed hugging, handshaking, touching, and proximity to all people, save a few, in something weirdly called a pod. Science tells us that touch triggers endorphins and the absence of hugs and handshakes has elevated a condition psychologists now call skin hunger. That suppressing need for physical contact. I've been at work on the challenges of rural aging, isolation and being lonely for nearly a decade. However, I have been working on being a more compassionate leader my entire life. Just about now, and for those of you who know me, and if we were together in person, I'd be calling for a group hug. Circumstances won't enable that today. So I ask all of you, wherever you are for a moment, to take your screen and hug it as a sign of unity and gratitude for all of the amazing work you do every single day. Hugging is a warm human tradition that has long nurtured us. A warm embrace really is souls coming together. And souls united in good cause and sound purpose can defeat all manner of social ailment. I am so profoundly grateful that science is tossing us the keys to get out of the worst of this pandemic, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and Moderna. Science is helping us to win the front end of our battle against the virus and isolation mandates. But friends, what about the long game? The pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on our vulnerable population and individuals who live in areas where they do not have access to healthcare or to family members or friends. It was for this very reason that in 2011, I launched the Healthy Villages Program, an organization providing mobile devices with health content and digital connection in some of the most remote places across the globe. And the results have been astonishing. For example, in a small community in East Africa, Healthy Villages has helped to reduce infant mortality from 100 babies dying per 1,000 births to less than 20 deaths per 1,000 live births. Yes, 80 more babies per 1,000 live births are now alive today as a result of healthy villages. Just because you are poor does not equate to your not having the same access to healthcare that we enjoy here in the United States. In fact, Article 25 of the Declaration of Human Rights states that healthcare is a basic right for every single person. And when one person does not have access, we have violated that declaration. But how do we mitigate at scale the problems of isolation and loneliness that are being compounded 
by new century factors of demographics, technology, and human mobility. Allow me to get to the heart of the matter, to my premise, if you will, by advocating the use of softer tools and inviting all of you to use your individual personal power too. Technology can only go so far. We also need human touch, compassion, community. Respect is all about gaining trust and you can unequivocally accomplish this by taking the time to hear the stories of other people. Digital connection can make this happen. Friends, I know you each have a story and so does your neighbor. So does the person who you meet for the first time. So does the person sweeping the floors where you conduct your office work. Story sharing and absorbing the inspiration and motivation found in these stories can create relationships that are real and sustainable. Throw out any biases you might have of someone you meet for the first time. I bet my bottom dollar you had biases about me today before I started my talk. And it is my hope that you shelve them immediately after hearing my story. Maya Angelou, a great modern poet who passed in 2014, once said, quote, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you, end of quote. I rarely start any conversation with tell me what you do. Rather, I start with the question, tell me about your why. Tell me about your passion. Allow me to let you in on a little secret. No one cares what we do until they know why we do it. Take time to pull stories out of others. And if you do not ask, you will not know. You can be a frontline champion of human connection, compassion, and connectivity. You can be Olympic grade champs if you practice what I call good story health. What do you have to lose? Try it for the next 21 days. Some years back, I wrote a memoir describing my childhood fight against isolation and loneliness and what we can learn from them. My story went through several printings. My second book, due to be released on March 1st, promotes the value of compassionate leadership in businesses and institutions, and it is titled The Double Bottom Line, How Compassionate Leaders Captivate Hearts and Deliver Results. In big businesses, they sometimes call their public shares their currency. In this book, I propose that compassion and kindness are the new currency of the new century. In the business world, in the institutional world, we must show empathy and more importantly, transfer that empathy into action if you want impact. My book explains why and how compassionate and empathetic leadership can build the bottom line. It connects the dots. Friends, you can connect the dots by being compassionate and empathetic, not only at your professional level, but also at the retail level, one human being at a time. We can reach out to strangers and friends alike one-on-one -on -one and ask a simple question. Are you lonely? Please share with me your story. These are not always easy conversations to have. Often people keep their stories or loneliness buried in shame or denial, as I have suggested, or as a coping mechanism. Here's a tip. Sometimes getting them to talk honestly about themselves starts with being a little bit vulnerable yourself, as I explain in my book. Open up, be vulnerable, love who you are. Loneliness and the feeling of diminished relevancy must come out of the closet, and you can be the ambassador for how we change the conversation 
in this new generation of leaders. And in this effort to build connection, we have a quintessential opportunity to make it okay to say, I am lonely. If I have done my job this morning, all of you will go about your work even more united and your understanding that human connection can drive the efficacy of the solutions you pursue. Mark Twain once said, the two most important days in your life is the day you are born and the day you find out why. Let today be that quintessential moment whereby you discovered your other why, namely to be the ambassadors for a more compassionate and kinder world. Thank you. Incredible. And, um, you know, deeply touching and uh, much appreciated, Donato. Again, I think the, uh, the audience um, is, you know, absolutely responding to this. And I think when we, when we look at, we've got a few more minutes, uh, when we look at the work you've done here, it's obviously something that is profound and, 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 and deeply embedded in, in who you are. So I think the audience would like to know, uh, what is your passion and what drives you and what is your why? Yeah, I unfortunately discovered my why through a, a tragedy. And Stan, you know the story. I was supposed to be on the second plane on September 11th, uh, United 175. But because of a toothache, I got off the plane. But my two friends and their three-year-old child uh, did not. And they lost their lives. And I could have had bitterness and hatred in my heart, and I decided that that was not the right path to take. And so for the last 20 years, we launched the Tremuto Porter Foundation, my partner and I, and we have been helping young children uh, go to college who have had disabilities. So uh, we've helped hundreds of organizations deliver on their commitment to make the world more fair and just. And so my passion and why is that I would like to leave this world um, a tad better, um, than when I arrived into it. And that is my passion. And um, I kind of measure my life now, and I mentioned this in the book, by how many summers I have left. I think I have 20 summers left, I hope. And I intend to use those next 20 summers to continue to build on the work that, um, that I truly believe in, that we all can make a difference. That's brilliant. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And I think uh, it's so interesting you say that, because I know a lot of people in the Northeast in the you know the northern United States and certainly Canada, uh, they measure falls and, and autumns and springs. Yeah, that, that you know for the uh, that that's just wonderful, um, and that's a good measurement of of uh, what we're looking at here as well. So, again, a a very loud round of applause from uh, everyone around the world watching this. Donato Tremuto, uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Stan, and happy holidays to you and everyone. You as well. You as well. Make it a great day. You too. <clears throat> so again, <clears throat> just an amazing presentation there about uh, empathy and compassion during, and, and really his key messages around empathy and action, uh, which is uh, what will be coming out in his book, coming out in the spring of 22.